This is a picture of my daughter Isabel when she was about two and a half years old. At the time, she used to love creating these crazy Play-Doh concoctions, and pretty much anything that was in her wake would get sucked into the vortex of these things, and they would just get bigger and bigger, and she would just come up and show it with such joy, and then she would totally smash them apart and do it all over again. She loved the process of making, and then she loved sharing it with everybody else. And we're all born this way. As kids, we have this endless capacity to make stuff. And anyone who's been a parent of a preschooler knows this from the unending stream of paint blobs and mysterious macaroni art that comes into the home. And even for children, creating can have more practical goals. Like these beautiful kids I photographed in India last month, I'm amazed by the way that children can always find a way to play whether it's playing cricket with scrap wood or making a toy out of abandoned tires and sticks. Red Burns, my graduate school mentor, used to say something that these kids really understand. It's a poor craftsman who blames his tools. I'll talk a little more about Red later, but I want to focus back on this creative energy that drives us as kids and as adults in the design field. I'm really interested in what drives me and all of us to make things. It's not always an easy career path. I'm sure many of you at some point were try, kind of encouraged to consider other jobs that were more practical. I know my father just recently admitted to me that for several years he was really quietly terrified that I was gonna major in art history. <laughs> so why do humans make things? I pose this question to a bunch of makers that I know. Friends, followers on Twitter, design colleagues at Facebook. And the answers that I got were really interesting. I posed the question, why do you make? And I heard things like, to hold in my hand what I dream in my mind. Being creative, I'm unable to not make things. I'm driven to live a purposeful life, to make the world more beautiful and to express myself. Creating emotions, improving life of humankind, being able to sleep better because I know I contributed something good to the world. And from my Facebook design colleagues. As the years go by, lots of details make that question increasingly challenging to answer. But the basic motivation has never really changed. Making stuff is fun. Compulsively writing and recording music, the joy of process, gives me a sense of purpose. Plus, chicks dig it. Being a consumer gets boring quick. I could be vegetating by watching television, or I could get up off my ass and make something that matters to people. For myself, I just feel like I need to make stuff all the time, and I've been that way since I was a kid. If I don't, my soul starts to feel like it's dying a little. That last one was for me. There's a lot of nuances to these responses, and there's many more than I can share with you here today, but there's some really interesting themes that emerged. The first is we create for ourselves because it's fun, because it feels good, because we need to express ourselves, because we can't help it. We need to create. And some of us end up being pretty good at it. You might have been labeled the artist when you were a kid. We end up finding that we have a gift for creating things that resonate and please other people. And that's why a lot of us are here today. But there's something that moves us beyond the work of artists. As designers, we use creativity to solve problems and usually other people's problems. We're motivated to create for others. Some of us have a sense of altruism in making things. Now, on a personal level, when I knit or sew or bake for others in my spare time, which I don't have a lot of, <laughs> I do it to show that I care. And professionally, as a human-centered designer, we make things to hopefully improve the lives of others. Both are ways of showing our humanity. I've always believed that design is creativity and service of others. And though we get gratification from just the process of making, we also get a lot of satisfaction by helping others. We create for ourselves and we create for others. And sometimes in the process, we change the world. We can change it in small ways and big ways. And sometimes it's through the work of one person and often by many, many people. Now, my career has been in the areas of user experience and product design. 
and many of you may be in other areas of the design world. But I, I think all of us believe that, change, that design can be a very positive force of change in the world. But when we talk about world-changing design, I think we often jump to think about the more extroverted kinds of design, the kind that calls a lot of attention to itself. Brash new fashion design that influences trends, gorgeous sports cars that make other drivers on the road envious, and architecture that's meant to intimidate and inspire awe. And these can truly inspire people and stretch the boundaries of design. But it also puts design at the center of attention. And this works can often feel inaccessible to a lot of people in the world. I tend to be more fascinated by the quieter, everyday, almost mundane ways in which design can create change. In 2004, Paola Antonelli, the design director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, created an exhibit, and I just want to share a little bit of the introduction of the exhibit catalog with you. Everything is designed one way or another. Some objects are designed well, while others are not. Some are designed pretentiously, others unassumingly. Some are designed to optimize materials and techniques, while others are wasteful. Some are approachable and understandable, others instead trade on their unattainability. Design takes them all in, from chandeliers to pencils, from airplanes to computer screens, from the interior of a theater to the receipt of a department store's checkout. And while some objects naturally attach our, uh, attract our attention for their extraordinary character and desirability, many are so apparently ordinary as to go unnoticed. And if they work well, chances are we won't pay much attention at all. However, in spite of their modest price and demure presence, some of these things are true masterpieces of the art of design and deserve our unconditional admiration. The show was called Humble Masterpieces, and as the title indicates, it featured humble examples of design that were brilliant. Meeting the needs of people in new and novel ways, they become essential parts of our lives. Things like Band-Aids, or flat-bottomed brown paper grocery bags or ice cream cones. There's a humility about these designs that causes them to recede into the background, and sometimes to the point where people even forget that they're there. They don't command a lot of attention, but they change lives in small, subtle, meaningful ways every day. This is the kind of design that I aspire to. Now, the things that I've worked on in my career are pretty different than Band-Aids and paper bags. First of all, I'm not an industrial designer. I work in the realm of the digital. But it's also different because the products that I worked on started small, but soon mushroomed into these massive platforms of change. Change in the way people think about themselves and their place in the world, how they act towards others in their environment, and how they live day to day. And not just with individuals, but with all of us, all over the world, everywhere. Google search. YouTube, Facebook. These are products that I've had the privilege to help design over the years. And there's others that I admire enormously. Sites like Etsy and Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and Wikipedia. These platforms, these products, engage and impact huge numbers of people all around the world. And they've caused significant changes in the way that societies and markets work. But in a way that puts people and their ideas at the forefront. I'd like to share some thoughts and lessons that I've learned on working on these big platforms over the years. What attributes do they have in common? And how were they designed and developed? And what can we learn and apply to other areas of design? Here are a few observations. First, they're all open and adaptive. They're not finite, static experiences. They're living, organic systems, and they harness the creative power of the world. They evolve over time, like living creatures in the natural world through evolution. And they adapt to changes in their environment and become stronger as a result. And this adaptation is really important. Neither Google Search, nor YouTube, nor Facebook has ended up where it began. They either had a completely different goal in mind initially, or a dramatically more narrow scope that they were designing for. But they stayed adaptive, and they watched how their design was being used, and the unexpected directions that people took their designs in. And they learned. A really good example of this is hashtags on Twitter. This wasn't a feature that the Twitter team intentionally designed. It was something that the Twitter community created for itself 
to help in the discovery of trending content. But the Twitter team were smart, and they took that community-driven design and they incorporated it back into their product. It's a new, responsive, adaptive way to design, and it is critical to designing a platform and scaling it to global dimensions. Next, these products are focused on people. They require a human-centered approach to design. They're trying to solve real, basic, and enduring human needs. For Google, that need is to find information. For YouTube, it's to express yourself creatively. And with Facebook, it's perhaps the most enduring need of all, the need to connect and, not to, and to feel like you're not alone in the world. These are universal, timeless needs, and it's part of why these products have been so effective and grown so exponentially. Because while some needs are transitional, these needs will never go away. And if you can help fulfill a basic human need in a new and better way, you can do extraordinary things in the world. They're also not just human-centered, but they're human-driven. The creative force behind these products is real everyday people. They're creating, finding, and sharing content that's relative to them, relevant to them and to others. They're, the platform is a container and a conduit for others to find and create and connect. And the designs are heavily influenced by the teams who build them, but just as much by the people who use them. The communities don't depend on a group of experts to create content or to tell them what's important. Content and discovery of new work is the collective effort of millions and even billions of people. Facebook is a really good example of this. Now, everything on Facebook is seen through the lens of the people in your life. Now, this image is a mapping of all of the friend connections on Facebook throughout the world, over one billion people. And the scale and the power of this network I find awe-inspiring. The world is connected like never before, and it creates incredible new opportunities for design to add value to people's lives. With Graph Search, a product that we released last year, it connects you with people and things through the connections that you've made throughout your life. The world is generating so much content that it's become difficult to navigate and make good choices. By tapping into the experience of your friends and families and professional contacts, we can better find our way and make better decisions. So for example, when I was recently planning a trip to Mumbai, I could refer to printed and online professional guides, but I could also tap into my personal network of friends who know Mumbai well, and they know me well, so their recommendations are much more valuable to me than a stranger's. Next, these platforms are, in a sense, invisible to the people who use them. The technology behind them is massive and powerful, but if they're designed well, you shouldn't experience them that way. It's a really interesting challenge for a designer, and it reminds me of conversations that I have with a friend of mine who is a film composer in Hollywood. Now, he composes the scores that play while you're watching the film, the things that make the chase scenes so exciting or the death scenes so tragic or the comedic scenes so hilarious. And he and I always commiserate that the better we are at our jobs, the less people notice. When you compose a symphony, it's something that's explicitly supposed to be noticed and experienced. But when he makes a score for a film, he's supposed to heighten the experience without calling attention directly to himself or the music. Now, if you're in a movie theater watching one of his films, and you're thinking to yourself, man, this movie score is awesome. <laughs> he has totally failed at his job. But if you've ever seen a film without the score, you know how critical his contribution is. The same is true for this kind of design. You have to kind of check your ego at the door and be focused on elevating other people's work and be satisfied with invisibly orchestrating it from behind the scenes. Google's homepage is a good example of this. There's this stark simplicity that belies this unfathomable, powerful algorithm that's underneath the hood. And the person who uses it doesn't care about that. All they care is that they find what they're looking for. The technology isn't important to them, but the empowerment that they feel when they use the product is. Related to invisibility is neutrality. Now, these platforms tend to have a neutral aesthetic that's really essential to their growth. They need to have an agnostic attitude towards the content that they host. And much like a well-designed dinner plate or a picture frame, 
They're supposed to showcase and enhance the food or the painting or the photo and not draw too much attention to itself. This is really important for two reasons. One is that it elevates the presentation of all of the content, no matter who created it. And the second is that all the world feels comfortable and welcome in contributing. A couple of years ago, we had a big challenge when we were redesigning YouTube because the diversity of the content on the site is so, so dramatic. Everything from National Geographic documentaries about lions to the Khan Academy videos about algebra to Neon Cat. <laughs> now, if we scored too high or too low aesthetically, part of that video corpus would start to feel inappropriate in the container. And in particular, if we optimize too much for the high-end content, then the creators of most of YouTube's videos, everyday people like you and me, documenting everyday life and sometimes moments that are very, very interesting to the rest of the world, would start to feel like maybe my stuff doesn't belong in such a fancy container. The key was to create a neutral container that can still subtly enhance every video regardless of its maker and the production quality. This design principle of supporting a broad diversity of content is key to the growth of large platforms. Now all this talk of neutral design and humble masterpieces may make you think that beauty is not a goal, or maybe it's even impossible in these kinds of platforms. But just because something is designed with humility doesn't mean that it can't be beautiful. Just keep in mind things like traditional shaker design, or Muji from Japan, or the work of architecture for humanity, which creates shelter for communities in need. I'd hold these up against the most glamorous of luxury designs in terms of aesthetic appeal, but in addition, they're designed for real people and their real needs, and they have a groundedness that makes them appealing and accessible. A couple of years ago, the YouTube community created a film in partnership with Kevin McDonald and Ridley Scott. I think this film does a really great job of showing the power of humility and design. Good morning, everyone. Hola. Hola. Hello, life. I really love my family. Oh my god! I love football. Do you both promise to love and treasure each other? Oh, we do. I'm afraid of losing this place. I fear. Any kind of monster. Dogs. Growing up. Politics scares me more than anything. Stay safe. When I close my eyes, I can see all different people in the world. <laughs> I can feel it, I can touch it, I can see it. Best day ever. <laughs> I'm so inspired by designs that take seriously the lives and experiences of everyday people. It really changes the world when we can look at that world through a diverse set of eyes, because it's through that diversity that we're gonna be able to bring the benefits of good design to the whole world. So what does this mean to all of you? The scale of some of these platforms may seem pretty distant from the projects that you're working on day to day, but, and I don't think that these learnings can necessarily directly apply to all kinds of design problems, but I do think there's some important lessons that we can extract. The first is to be open to change in what you create and how you create it. The tighter you grip to your initial idea, the less likely you are to allow something better in. 
you can't be afraid to let go of a little bit of control because others might just take your idea in a wonderful direction that you hadn't thought of. I wanted to share a specific example that I thought this audience would particularly appreciate. Now, Facebook is lucky enough to have a really remarkable communication design team, and, uh, and they run a print shop called the Analog Research Laboratory. And it's really cherished by the whole company. And in the lab, product teams collaborate to produce these wonderful posters that reflect the values of the company or something interesting that's going on within that particular team. And the campus is covered with these ongoing conversations teams are having with themselves and with each other. And sometimes there's some pretty interesting outcomes. One team wanted to create a poster about getting other people to fix bugs in their products. Bugs being tiny things that might be broken in the product that people are using. And it was meant as a counterpoint to Facebook's famous and sometimes controversial mantra, move fast and break things. But they shared a slightly different notion. Slow down and fix your shit. Now, <laughs> that's not the end of the story. Somebody decided that a bit of humility was lacking in the original design. And so they hacked their own derivative work, if you will. <laughs> now, I love this for a few reasons. Um, one is that this ongoing conversation about what happens when product quality suffers. It's not somebody else's problem. It's everyone's problem. In building software, or building a home, or printing a book, we rely on many people to get the job done right. Excellence is a team sport. But I also love that in our Facebook team culture, this questioning is completely acceptable and even encouraged. The first poster was just a part of an ongoing conversation facilitated by design. And what a more meaningful conversation the team was able to have as a result. Being open to change and harnessing the huge pool of intelligence and creativity beyond ourselves is a huge part of what I'm talking about today. And if we can be open to it, we can make our work better and the impact of our work will be greater. Next, we need to keep tech in its proper place. In our industry, people get so enamored of the technology that sometimes they have failed to apply it in ways that truly matter. This was instilled early on in my career by Red Burns, my mentor, who founded the Interactive Telecommunications Program at New York University. The timing of this talk, talk is a bit poignant for me because Red recently passed away. But she lived and taught the values that I'm speaking about today, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't honor her contributions and influence in me. She was known as the godmother of Silicon Alley, which is New York's technology scene. But she wasn't that interested in technology. It was kind of a means to an end, and the end was people. Her, my favorite quote by her is this. To me, the computer's just another tool. It's like a pen. You have to have a pen and to know penmanship, but neither will write the book for you. Don't become a slave to technology in your design work. Your job is to empower people through technology, so don't forget who is serving whom. And as Paola Antonelli attested, amazing design can be achieved when it's done with a dose of humility. Being humble as a designer means designing with other needs in mind and avoiding getting caught up in the ego and glamour of the work. What matters is the impact of what you do with your gifts and your talents. This is especially true when you work on a product like Facebook that's used by a significant percentage of the human race and as we aspire to engage the rest of the world in the coming years. This is what Facebook looks like on, for most of the phones that are used around the world. This is what humility in design looks like. It's not about just designing exclusively for $500 devices that are inaccessible to the majority of the world's population. It's about designing for all people, where they are now, and not where we are or where we wish they were. Some people look at this and moan and gnash their teeth because they have to work in such terrible constraints. How can we create something beautiful in this kind of context? But connecting people to the rest of the world and all the societal benefits that can come through that connection look pretty damn beautiful when you're on the receiving end. If we want to connect the whole world and improve the lives of billions of people, we need to roll up our sleeves. There's a lot of work to do, and designers should be right in the middle of it. Because as the movie trailer from The Life in a Day shows, 
small, humble things in life can add up to something quite monumental if we design it with some humility. And the last, amidst all the sweat equity and seemingly insurmountable challenges that stand between you and the world-changing design that you aspire to, don't lose touch with your joy. Remember that kid inside that you used to be and face the world and joyfully say, look at what I made for you. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. And now there are little things all over my chair. I know, there's confetti. Um, so I'm with you on the beauty, beauty of Shaker simplicity and the humility of, of utility and all that and functionality. But Facebook has made a choice at whatever stage, long before you were there presumably, that it would, it would not uh, express a brand personality in the way even that Google does with the multicolored letters and mm -hmm. that I feel lucky and the Google Doodle. Is, is that an irrevocable choice? And, and, and does, do you ever feel, well, maybe we ought to have a little personality? It worked for Yahoo back in the day. I think it's an interesting question, and I think it's something that we talk a lot about inside of Facebook, because I think um, it's a similar challenge that Google and YouTube face when you want to create something that you literally want everyone in the world to participate right. in. Because the moment that you um, add too much personality to it, you start alienating people. Uh, I think the challenge is to figure out how to add enough nuance and to visually express the values of what we're trying to bring to the world right. um, in ways that don't uh, cut people out. And I think it's kind of an ongoing process. Yeah. I think the mobile experience is also quite different from the desktop in that it's, it's so much more personal because it's a person's um, you know, kind of object um, that they're carrying around with them every day. Right. And so I think that that's changed and as somebody well. here said the other day, touching and stroking yeah. as though it's your yeah. pet or your yeah. child. Yeah. I think one of the things, too, that you know, the world is enabling you know, much more visual communication through photography and video, and I think that that's also something to keep in mind, is that those, those media are very kind of immersive, and um, you know, we have to be careful not to uh, conflict and, uh, and distract um, sure. from the content. But you itself. also don't want to become the electric company yeah, or absolutely. the water company. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, I think it's true. And I think, I think our, our challenge is to figure out how to yeah. strike that balance. It's one of the reasons, I mean, I was looking back in pre preparing for this to see when it was that Facebook began to crush and then crushed MySpace. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, six years, seven years ago, MySpace had 100 million users and, and Facebook didn't even get there for another couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I, want, I mean, one of the reasons, it seems to me, is, is a design choice, is mm -hmm. this standardization, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, the standardization of coherence that Facebook brought as opposed to the sort of shanty town democracy of MySpace. Yeah. Is, is, is that fair? Well, I think, I think that real identity is a huge part of it, actually. I think that people actually really want to know who they're talking to. Yeah. And um, because Facebook is really intended to build on top of real world relationships in addition to crafting new relationships. And I think that that's part of why that platform has been so successful. Yeah. You, uh, you, you back in the day that I referenced earlier, worked for small startups. For a while, you have been working at and thriving at these big companies. Mm -hmm. Is there something about you, temperamentally, that <laughs> is able to thrive in such places? I've thought about that because... <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> um, I think part of it is that I really like working in teams. And when you're working on a product like this, nobody can um, go off and you know, work in a vacuum. Um, it's very much about relationship building. It's about working very closely with engineers and not being territorial about the design process. And that's something that I really enjoy. Well, I was and, gonna ask you about engineers in, in, yeah. because we don't have much time, so yeah. I apologize for rushing. Yeah. But in the tribes that must exist in a company like Facebook, mm -hmm. let's reduce it to sales and marketing people and engineers, yep. you're kind of in between. We're pretty squarely in the group of people that build stuff. So in you're design. more in the engineer tribe. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's quite collaborative. We sit inter, in interdisciplinary groupings, and you've got marketing, design, product management, engineering, all sitting together. 
And, and do you fight? Oh yeah, it would be no fun if we didn't fight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, conflict is a, an inherent you know, part of the creative process and uh, you know, um, people from other disciplines have great design ideas. I think sometimes designers get into a lot of trouble by um, trying to protect their turf uh -huh. um, and instead, uh, instead of kind of bringing people into the process. After all, the, dis the engineers are the ones who have to build it and you know, you don't want to be completely on the receiving end of somebody else's ideas. Order. You want to, yeah. you know, you want to feel like you have a sense of or, uh, contribution to it. Great. Yeah. Think about some brand personality. We'll work on it. You'd be surprised at how much um, authentic affection people have for the brand, even, even though it doesn't seem yeah. that, you know, especially when... Because I, I noticed the antipathy that people occasionally have for the brand as yeah, well. Yeah, but I know? think, you know, I think when we're in cultures where we have freedom of speech and um, relatively well-functioning democracies, although in the past couple of weeks, you yeah, know, yeah. maybe we're not, that's not our strong suit, but, you know, we take for granted what these platforms mean. Yeah. One trip to a, a different kind of culture where people don't take those things for granted, they look at these brands in very different ways. And most of your, by far and away, most of your users are now not American. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And I, I think, you know, these things tend to be a lifeline and sometimes the only lifeline that people have. Yeah. A pleasure, Margaret. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much.